Okay, so you guys have heard us talk about Honcho, Pickleball League. Uh, so we've identified the five final cities. So that's Austin, LA, Dallas, Phoenix, and Houston. So if you're in those cities, uh, you should sign up and obviously get your friends to sign up. Pre-registration is closing and formal registration is opening this week. So look out for that. Um, and uh, we're also rolling out a Me Plus 3 program, which basically incentivizes you to help us uh, recruit different players. You get all sorts of bonuses um, for, for doing that and, and helping us build out the, the league. Okay, Nationals is coming up in Dallas. Uh, it's going to be the biggest pickleball party ever. It's going to be musical performances by Phil Phillips, a beer garden. It's a massive party. It's going to be the biggest pickleball tournament ever. Best players in the world. Uh, we're sending one lucky person and their friend, two nationals, all expenses paid. So you can enter at the dinkpickleball.com slash nationals giveaway. All right. I mean, I think we're live. I, I really don't, I really don't know. We just spent 30 minutes trying to troubleshoot this. Rachel sat there, thinks we're unprofessional, which to a degree, I think we are, but we're here and we're live. Rachel Rohrbacher, welcome to the Pickle Pod. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, all right, so you're the MLP champion. How does it feel, both of you? You guys are uh, MLP champs. Rachel, I, did you even see this as a possibility like a month ago? Um, I don't really know. It's like a really weird question because um, I didn't really know what to expect anyway. So I kind of just went in wanting to do my best. And like I always think there's a chance of winning. So I went out there to win. Um, but Zane might have more to say on that because he's played a bunch. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I predicted that we were going to win our, our group. That's for sure. And that's, I, the, that's the only thing that you, you predicted, predicted that we you weren't... guys are were going to go to the final and win. I, I said, you guys wouldn't drop a game the entire, you thought we weren't going to get out of group stage, homie. Um, no way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you're not a pickle pod listener. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, okay. I that's be. what I thought. Thanks. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. Now I see what's up. Well, so you're, you're, I, I was talking to Thomas beforehand and I was like, man, I have a lot of really good questions for Rachel because I actually don't know all that much about Rachel still, even after playing this whole, whole weekend with you. So we want to, we want you to take us back like pre MLP, pre pickleball, like just what was your, what was your deal from before pickleball? Like, I know you knew Anna, you played the whole junior circuit and whatnot. Like, yeah, take us through that. Wait, can I? Hold on. Oh, hold my goodness. Can are, I, you gonna, are you going to let her talk? No. Can I hijack this for a second here? I want to I wanna just ask both of you. Before we, before we do that, I just want to know, like, what does it feel like to win Major League Pickleball? How did it feel? And how did you guys celebrate afterward? Did you guys pop any champagne? Did you go to dinner? Or is it like, we just got to get out of here. We got to go home. Rachel? We went to dinner. Um, it was <laughs> nice. That was it. I mean, I was so tired. I'm not going to lie. Like, I just think, like, there's a picture of me after the match. Like, my hands are just on my knees. Like, I was just, like, it's just all the release of all the adrenaline. Like, it was crazy. I was so tired. <laughs> it was kind of funny. We had a dinner with, uh, with Amin, Olivia, and Grumpy Jeff from our team. And, um, and they're like, so you guys going to celebrate it all? And I celebrated with a couple diet Cokes. Yeah. Rachel had a couple diet Cokes. Anna had a, had a mocktail. And the funniest part was we, we win at like, whatever it was, it was like two o'clock. We win at like two o'clock. We finally get out of there probably around four. We're back to the hotel. We start texting at like four fifteen, like, Hey, let's do something for dinner. Four seventeen. Andre texts us back. He's like, sorry, guys, I'm out for dinner. I'm on a boat and I'm pretty hammered right now. And this is like literally this is literally like half an hour after we've left the venue. This man has acquired alcohol and a boat. <laughs> well, why? How does he not invite you guys onto the boat? What kind of teammate is that? Really valid question. That is a valid you question. You guys all should have been on that boat. You know, the New York Giants that one year when like they were slated to be like the best team and it was like preseason essentially or maybe it was like going into the playoffs and they all go like party on a boat in jeans and like Timberlands like that should have been you guys but it would have been well deserved because you were you were champions at that point so well that was Andre 
not in jeans and Timberlands, but his very short orange shorts. Was he with other like pickleball players or no, it was just him and his family and his and his coach? This is kind of messed up. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. So anyway, that's how we celebrated and that's how Andre celebrated. Yeah. <laughs> um but anyway, back to my question. Yeah, okay. I'm <laughs> Rachel, <done. laughs> tell us about yourself. We'll we'll start in the past and we'll work our way back towards MLP. Yeah. How how'd you get here? Um, well, I played junior tennis, um, and that grateful for it, but so happy that's over. Um, I basically got put into tennis because my parents just wanted me to get a scholarship to school. So, um, when that came around, um, I had a really pretty good career, um, at the university of South Carolina where I played tennis and, um, my junior year kind of went almost undefeated the entire year and, um, got ranked nine in the nation in doubles. Um, and then my senior year came around and I was a little bit more injured. So I was in and out of the singles lineup, but still doing well in doubles. And, um, by the time the SEC championships, um, came about, um, I was playing again and we won the SEC championship my senior year. And, um, we got ranked as high as three in the nation and we made it to the elite eight in the NCAA as well. So that's kind of how that went. Okay. And then your birth into pickleball, at what point are you like, all right, I'm going to go. Well, Thomas, I got, I got other questions. Right, dude, like, I want to know, <laughs> but you, you grew up, we were in the van, we were driving over to get some food and you knew like a bunch of these people already. Like you had grown up playing against Anna. You guys knew all the same, same people. Like, is it weird to see all these people now familiar faces? Um, it is a little weird at first because you kind of have that junior tennis perspective on them. It's like we're all young and we're all annoying and do their own weird things in tennis. But um, now it's been helpful to like just take a step back and see how much that like I've grown and we're not junior tennis players anymore. And um, we're coming as adults into a new sport. And it's been it's actually been surprisingly not as bad as I thought it would be. I was worried that this was going to turn into junior tennis. So that's why I was like, oh, do I really want to play pickleball and just be playing people in junior tennis? But it's really not like that at all. Mm. So you said you've grown a lot. Were you the problem in junior tennis? No, I definitely was not. the. <laughs> So there Anna hasn't really been anyone problematic anyway. And that's been into, I know that's probably where your next question is going, but no, there was no one problematic. I've actually Rihanna Valdez, who I've been playing with, she went to USC. We both went to Australia. Both of our teams went to Australia our senior year and we played, our teams played against each other at the Australian open, which was really cool. So I know her as well. Nice. Okay. Thomas, we can go back to your question. Well, okay. Yeah. So at what point are you uh, picking up your, your first pickleball paddle? Like what, what's the story there and how long ago was that? So I graduated in 2019. I kind of did my own thing for a bit. And then at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, I started working for um, my previous junior tennis coach um, down in Tampa or it's called Barmore Country Club. And when I was working there, they kind of put a pickleball paddle in my hand and they were like, hey, we want you to teach. We think you'd be really good. You should play. And I was playing a little bit. I actually played a tournament. I think it was in 2020 when um, I played with Becky Ryan and we played against Jesse Irving and Irina. And Leia says she remembers watching that match. We almost beat them in the consolation. Like, and that was one of my first tournaments. And she was like, who is this girl? And then she told me about that, how she remembers that now. But um, anyway, after that, in 2021, I think I just started it so soon after tennis, kind of was super burnt out. And I was like, I don't want to do this. So I stopped playing for like a year and a half and didn't pick it back up until mid last year. Got it. Okay. And then so I mean, before this, what was like your best result in a in a pro tournament? Um. So I had actually gotten silver in an APP singles when I picked it up last year. I just played singles because no one would play doubles with me. Like no one knew who I was. So I just was like, okay, I guess I'm going to play singles. And I got, I got silver there. I lost to Sloan Davidze in the final. Did that remind you of junior tennis? I no one would play with me. <laughs> you hate to see it. So what were you doing? Is, were you, were you, didn't you get a, a master's in, uh, what was it? PT? Um, I got a master's in social work, but, um, it's mental health. So I was, um, during my practicum, I was also a mental health therapist for children here in Indiana. And, um, 
I was doing that since 2021. So when I was burnt out from pickle and I quit my tennis job in 2021, I was like, I want to get my master's. So um, that's what I did. Okay. How'd you end up in, in Indiana? Um, my boyfriend, um, played for the team here. So he, um, played for FC Cincinnati during COVID and then got, um, traded here. And then, um, he ended up retiring last year. So I'm actually heading back to Cincinnati because he's going to be, he's coaching there now. So we're going to Cincinnati. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So Rachel, I don't, when you, can you see us when we're talking, we're still troubleshooting this a little bit. That's totally fine. I see myself right now. Okay. We might have to leave it like that. So you might just have to stare at yourself this whole time because <laughs> I think that's going to be the best way to present this. So Okay. Um, that sounds good. Yeah. All right. Wait. So who is this your- This is who is somehow your... worse than Ignatowicz in his car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is on ours. This is on us. This We're, is on us. And that was like the one thing we we told Rachel. Yeah. We had we had car. two rules. Don't be on your in your car. And what was the second one? Uh have airpods have airpods yeah both rules bo rules both one and two are because of james ignatowich yeah correct um okay so answer this for me who who's your gm i think you mentioned three people who were at dinner with you or is that like your ownership group i would say jeff is probably our our gm uh jeff and and ryan um ryan uh and michelle own the team mm -hmm. uh, as or I guess they're the most involved of the people who who own the team, and Jeff is probably the person who manages most of the day to day stuff. Right? Would you think that? Would you say that's accurate, Rachel? Yeah, and Danny, who's also, I mean, he's not GM, but he's also an owner. He was there too, which was pretty cool. Got it. Are you guys? Were you guys more of a, a player coach team, or did you have anybody on the bench that was, uh, you know, oh yeah, drilling in on the X's and O's? Oh, we had we had uh, we had Andre's coach. Okay. He offered us. He offered us super insightful stuff like stay hot, stay hot, <laughs> yeah. stay hot. Yeah, we, okay. it was one 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 in a game. Stay hot. Stay hot. We're like, oh. <laughs> yes. It was literally that was uh, that was Sunday's match. It was the first women's match. One one. They win the first point, lose the second, and it's stay hot. Stay yeah. hot. But yeah, I yeah, loved yeah. it. I loved yeah, it. I right. thought stay hot meant when he said it in that moment. I was like, okay, maybe I don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Did he get an invite on the boat? I think he must have been on the boat. My guess would be he was on the boat. This is, this yeah, is up. but uh, he was he was definitely when the ladies were playing or when Andre was playing. Basically, when I wasn't playing, he was giving me a couple of of tidbits. Like he knew what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. He and I were seeing the same the same stuff, okay. and so it was nice to be to be validated and uh, and he he knew what he was he was talking about. But he also sort of knew his he knew his role. He's Andre's coach, right? He's not mine. Yeah. Like it's, it's a little bit of a weird dynamic. I would have, you know, I'd respect anything that he says and he knows what mm -hmm. he's talking about. Um, but he would sort of pass his insights along to somebody on the team to then give to the person on the court. So right. it wasn't like a, a Wes Gabrielson who was, you know, going sure. on the court and or, talking to his players or breaking up fights, which we saw in uh, one of the challenger matches, which was uh, very true interesting. That. Yeah. True that. Um, okay, so one of the things we talked about heading into the weekend was like, I was pretty convinced that there would be some tension, uh, given everything that had happened. Did you guys feel like there was uh, heightened tensions, more competitiveness, animosity out there? Like, how did you guys perceive it being on the court and in the mix of the action? Do you want to go first, <laughs> Um, I personally didn't feel anything. I think a little bit of ignorance is bliss. Like I'm super new, so I'm not really involved in any conversations that are being had. Um, so I kind of just was out there more to, I felt like I had something to prove. So I was really just focusing on myself and my own game. For yeah. sure. Nice political answer. What about you, Zane? I was actually surprised how normal it felt. I kind of thought there okay. would be a little bit more tension. I, yeah. I didn't notice it too much. Right. Um, I really didn't. Okay. What about your team specifically? I know you and Andre had played together a little bit. I'm sure you've you've done some some pickup with with Anna. I don't think you guys have ever played together. We played, played against Houston together her. last year. Oh, okay. So you it have to some... go great. Got it. Okay. Um It was her fault, obviously. Rachel, had you played with any of your team previously? Um, so I had played with Andre in the Utah tournament. 
um, we got that together and we did pretty well. We beat Anna and James the first, our, our, our second round. And right. then we actually lost to Zane in the round of 16 right after that. Um, so that was the only time I'd ever played against Zane or, and then with Andre. And then I went down to Orlando during that Yola clinic thing down there. Um, and I stayed for about four or five days, just drilling with Anna and also playing with her. Right. Okay. All right, so in the championship match, you guys go down zero games to two. What's that like in that moment? I think anybody, you know, somebody who is watching from the couch is like, this does not look good. But obviously there's there's a path to, um, you know, making a, a comeback and pulling it out. But like, what's the energy like that on the team, on the bench? What are you guys saying to each other in that moment? Well, besides stay hot. <laughs> Um, well, we, uh, I think Rachel and Anna lost for the first time all weekend and like, I thought played well and Jackie and Jade played, played very well. Andre and I got down big. I switched over to the left at like after we were down and I was actually, I was feeling really good from the left Mm -hmm. towards the end of that match. I was feeling it. And so we, (laughs) but we lost. And so we were putting our lineup out first we put out Anna and Andre, mm-hmm. and I, I just like from the start of of that match, I I was just saying, guys, I want a uh, a freaking uh, mixed match. Like Rachel and I had been bawling out, and like I knew that they had a very very good chance of of beating um, Christian and. Uh, and Jackie and I thought that Rachel and I on paper were were pretty big underdogs but like we just wanted to we wanted to play right and so uh, there were definitely some there were definitely it definitely wasn't a freaking mixed match that I was saying but that entire match I was just saying get us a get us a mixed match because I knew we go to a dream breaker we are big favorites like Mm -hmm. all we have to do is claw it back right but I don't know what how did you how did you feel in that O two 2 moment when Andre, or when Andre and I get down pretty big, like, I don't know. What'd you think, Rach? The mountain definitely was getting taller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like we, it was like getting, I was like, Oh, okay. Um, but when they put Jackie and Christian, I thought for sure it was going to be Riley and Jade against them. So when they put Jackie and Christian, I was like, I definitely think they can get one on the board. And I was feeling, I don't know if you remember, I look at you and I'm like, I'm feeling crazy. Like I'm feeling super fiery right now. Like <laughs> and I told him like three times, I think like, so I was really just really getting ready to go out there because I think obviously I know who people are, but I know like it doesn't sink in yet. Cause I haven't played Riley Newman. I haven't played, like I haven't really felt anything. So I'm just like, I'm just going to try to like, I just was really excited that I was going to get to go against them because I'm kind of just like a wild card. And if I'm going crazy, like it goes by super fast. So maybe they won't catch on quick enough. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like, it's almost like to your advantage that, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of, sort of green, right. It's, it's yeah. essentially like, nothing to lose only upside especially in that moment when you're when you're down to zane what do you, do you think there was like an advantage to especially like you know when rachel goes up against riley to riley not really knowing rachel's game i mean i i, th- I think so yeah i, I would have guessed though that not knowing riley's game is more is more difficult right yeah so tennis players all sort of play a little bit the same like you can, you sort of have tennis strokes. You can kind of read where a tennis player is mm-hmm. is going, right? So I would think in a matchup between Riley never seeing Rachel before and Rachel never seeing Riley before, I think that Riley has the the advantage in that because his his game is more unconventional. Rachel's game is like she's going to get a high forehand and put you in a coffin, <laughs> like. Um, but didn't work out that way. That's for sure. She is Rafa's daddy, and she's Riley's daddy too. <laughs> yeah. And our right, well, our podcast episode is going to be called "Call Her Daddy." What, what what's this daddy talk? Can I can we get can we get to the bottom of this? Is this just like you felt that in the moment in that interview, and then now we're just we're we're carrying we're here, on with it. It's a thing now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. She's got t shirts made and everything. Yeah. Um. Well, 
Rafa decided he was going to talk a little shit after they beat us in in men's doubles. So after we won the match and Rachel, she was like going behind Rafa. She was hitting Rafa. She just lit up Rafa in mixed. And so, you know, we get Cameron to to do the interview. And I'm like, well, Rafa, Rafa punched first. He threw the first punch. Right. Wait, what so. exactly did he say? He said, well, he, he said some of the same stuff. He's like, I've partnered up with Zane, a lot of respect there, but boy, do I like him playing that right. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, all right, Rafa. And so I started out the same way. I'm like, played with Rafa, a lot of respect, but Rachel is his daddy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a bunch of the questions, because we put up some Instagram posts and stuff to get some questions for you, Rachel. And a lot of them had to do with um, what it was like raising Rafa as a child, um, you know. Uh, was he, he, a good he was actually a really a good kid? sport about it. Uh, he was funny about it. So we can say that stuff because we're we're buddies with Rafa. Like you've you've played a bunch with Rafa or hit hit a bunch with him too, haven't you? Yeah, we've played um, two tournaments so far, and we, I mean, I don't know about hit a bunch. I don't think I've ever played against him to be honest until that match, and then we're actually playing again together at in Vegas next weekend. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we're all buds. I saw. Yeah, he he was a really good sport about it. Little mother mother son duo there. That'll be fun. <laughs> um, so I remember draft day. We were we were all on the phone, um, discussing the the fourth pick, and I was like, I play great with Susanna Barr. I would love to play with Susanna Barr. I don't know anything about about Rachel, like. I, I just I don't know, mm-hmm. um, but when you get picked, didn't weren't Jackie and Jade the ones that told you that you got yes. picked? Yes, I didn't know where anything was going on. I didn't know anything, and I'm just like I was kind of on Twitter trying to follow, but I did not know what was going on. And then I get a text from um, Johnny like we can get you i'm so sorry and i was like oh crap um i guess i'm not going premiere and then like i get a text from jackie and she was like dude let's go and i was like what happened and she was like you got drafted and then as soon as she said that anna start and it was calling me but it was just really funny because jackie was the one who told me <laughs> so had that not happened did you assume you know challenger challenger at best like when you find out yeah. you're getting yeah like what, what what you're thinking around that about like where I would have gone if Anna didn't pick me. Yeah, yeah. Like, what what were you anticipating? I was thinking. I mean, I was hoping I would get in challenger. I had talked to a few premier people, premier teams, and then I was talking to a few challenger who I it made it seem like they were going to pick me, but um, and I don't know where I would have went. Like, I really don't. I can't say. Wait. So, so what's that like ahead of actually being drafted when you're sort of like having preliminary feel it out conversations with with different gms and owners like how how does that work do you just get like a text and you hop on the phone and they sort of yeah. say yeah yeah so what i did to a few um i just knew i kind of had to market myself um because no one really knew who i was at that point and i was like i gotta get to work a little bit at least make a connection um so they can hear my voice and talk to me a bit but i reached out to a few premier teams and um the ones that responded back I got hopped on the a call with and um, we spoke for a little bit. And then the challenger ones, um, a couple reached out to me and it was more texting with them. I also spoke to Richie in person um, in Newport, um, the tournament before the draft. So um, that's how that works. But it's just like really, it's hard to tell, like it's hard to gauge. Like I had, I was just trying to sell myself and I was like, I knew someone was going to have to take a chance if Premier got me. I said, it's going to be a huge investment and chance and i was like i don't know if anyone's willing to take that chance but I, that's i knew it was going to be like that if i got picked on premiere right so anna's the one who presented that idea to you guys zane actually i think it was was it not jeff and amin like they, no. they i think I we talked to about anna it the night dinner. before yeah so i think they had mentioned something about it and that like yeah put it on her her radar I know that there was some input from from the team there for sure. Yeah. So when you so you, like you're on the phone ahead of making that pick, right, with Anna and Andre mm-hmm. and the ownership. 
right? Because you mm-hmm. kind of walked away from our table and you you go jump on the phone. Mm-hmm. And like, what are those conversations like? Like, what are you guys saying to each other? And then when Rachel's brought up, what's the is is Anna the one who's sort of like the biggest proponent, kind of saying why she thinks we we should take Rachel, or like how how does that all play out? Well. The basically the way that it played out was we were looking at the standings and the squeeze were I think like something like nineteenth or twentieth out of twenty four in the standings and so basically need a need a a home run in order to be in the Premier League next time right right and so Rachel was the riskiest person that we could have picked in that in that but also the highest reward and yeah. so when you're already down in nineteen twenty range it's like go big or go home and also the way that the financials work out for somebody like like me or any of the team the players on the team you are far better financially booming and busting meaning like you're better off having some events where you finish last some events where you finished first your expected payout would be much larger because it's so top heavy so we were all pretty on board with with taking a a shot with an unknown just because we think that, you know, she had awesome potential. And obviously, I think Anna knew a lot about your your tennis prowess and the fact that, like you said, you went almost undefeated in, in a really serious tennis competition. And I think that that actually is something that really led to the fact that you were super calm, cool, and and collected in your very first Major League Pickleball event. Like, that's not easy to do. Can you t- what do you, I guess, do you, what do you attribute that, that to? Like, were there nerves? Um, yeah, were you nervous? What? I honestly didn't feel nervous. I just had so much fun. And I, and I promise like that, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it was just so much fun. I definitely was in my element. I think I do better with people watching because it makes me focus every match. Like if you put me on a backcourt, like, I'm more likely to be a little less focused. Um, But I just love the environment. I love the energy. I think a big part of my game or in tennis, like when I was on um, South Carolina, they, we were in trouble if, um, and punished if we didn't cheer and if we weren't screaming after every point. So I was kind of bred that way. And MLP is a place where you're not judged for that. And I, I was in definitely in my element of like top competition, just like, yeah, it's just, it would reminded me exactly of the SEC. Um, cause it was funny. A lot of people were like, you, she's never played MLP. Like this is crazy. And I'm like, the SEC is kind of worse than the MLP. So, um, yeah how, how so how do those compare like championship match that crowd that energy that pressure to i don't know like a so the crowd like was definitely important like, you, like the sec to mlp yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. um the crowd was definitely better in mlp um that's for sure i mean better like nicer or and no, like if there was a bigger one um yeah yeah right it was i mean the squeeze fans were amazing i mean oh my gosh they were so awesome they were at so many matches and um in the the sec there's not as many fans but the difference is is like you're with a team for four years working day in day out for that moment so it was just like a kind of a different feeling of because of you know the teammates you have known for years and you work three to four hours a day together like playing tennis and um it was just kind of a different meaning but not that mlp didn't mean a lot like mlp was a huge deal was amazing but it was just like they there's different journeys and signify different things in my opinion sure i think it's pretty interesting just going back right like now that there is no relegation and promotion next year it is just free agency then that would not have factored in the decision to go for that higher upside pick so that- no, I think I think it probably still would. I still think that the logic of boomer bust uh, is is there is present. It's I think it still probably would have not to the same degree. It wouldn't have affected relegation and promotion, but I think it's still a good strategy. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. I wonder if now more people would take a risk um, 
you know, to see if they do really well instead of playing it safe, because now maybe it doesn't really, I mean, it matters, but like the promotion relegation is taken away. Right. Yeah. There was definitely an incentive for certain teams to play it safe, right? If you're at the top of the, the, the leader, uh, the, the scoreboard, right? If Orlando squeeze was in the third position, I think our owners would have been less likely to take a, a Rachel and more likely to take a more known player. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, like, I think the players all want the chance to win. Winning is the most imp is, imp is, imp is the most important thing. I'll take a pandas season for a squeeze season. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me um, let me read Anna's text about uh, what went on behind the scenes. Okay. So Rachel, you haven't you haven't heard this yet, but Anna said, "I knew they were going to take me," referring to the squeeze. But if they did at three, I was worried there'd be no true left side man available. So I told them a half hour before the draft to trade down and told them I knew Columbus would take me at six, but didn't think Aces or DC would. So they traded to five. She said, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can say this on air, but I wanted someone who gave us a chance to win in both play style and in clutchness. I've seen X, I won't say the name, choke too much at MLP. So I felt good about it. Me and Jackie, Kaomoto, um, actually, I won't read that. But then she goes, I knew Rachel had massive balls. Care to comment? How big are your balls? Yeah. <laughs> are you actually asking? <laughs> She's fathered a lot of children. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's a no comment. We'll, uh, we'll take it as uh, pretty big, and you definitely, uh, you definitely showed that up. Con play books. She plays con play books. Yeah. Um, all right. So both of you, how does this rank in terms of career, whether it's pickleball or tennis in terms of wins? Does this feel like this is uh, the best win you've ever had? Does this feel like, you know, it's it's really an achievement? And how does it compare to any other wins you've had in your, your past? Rachel? Um, it's up there. I mean, I love team events. So I'd say it's up there with the SEC championship for sure. Like the feeling was awesome. Um, the environment, the energy and environment just made it all better. Um, granted, I don't have many other, pick, any other pickleball wins, so, but it was great. Yeah, for me, I would say it's, it's definitely probably up there with the, the first MLP event. Um, just that being the, the very first time to, to win something like that. And it was another pretty, pretty big come from behind win with, with Rafa Paris and, uh, and Irina. That was awesome, but this is also, I feel like, a little bit more meaningful because last year there was only half of the, the player pool, probably a little bit more than half the player pool. Now, to win MLP with every single top player participating, that's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool accomplishment. And to do it having fought off a championship point and being down 2-0, to zero, like, that's a pretty epic comeback that might yeah. not be matched for a while. Yeah. All right. So a lot of people think like the, the dream breaker. Well, not a lot of people. Some people think the dream breaker can be a little bit gimmicky. It's a little too much of a departure from what the core of MLP is, which is, you know, doubles. You won two of your matches in a dream breaker. How do you guys feel about the dream breaker generally? Is that, are, are you guys fans of the dream breaker? Obviously you're, you, you fared well in them. <laughs> yeah. But, um, Rachel, we'll, yeah, we'll let, Rachel. we'll let, I don't know if Zane, like, because I feel like you've obviously been a part of it longer. I, I personally don't even know what else they would do for a breaker. So it makes sense to me. Um, I think um, I had a lot of fun. And it actually suits me. Like, I need to swing out in tight or tight situations or high pressure situations. So I think the singles really helps me because, you I mean, you're going baseline to baseline. You got to swing out. So it makes me, I mean, I like it. Yeah. I mean, I think you're talking to a couple of people who are comfortable on the singles court too. Right. So I, I really like it as well. And I like it not necessarily just for the singles element, but because drafting it, it impacts draft strategy considerably, right? Where you can't simply draft a team that's going to win you two matches. Mm -hmm. Right. And so some could argue that the Chicago Slice was drafted in a way that would win them two matches. And then they lose in a Dream Breaker, potentially, right? So having to factor in somebody's 
singles worth, I think just adds an extra element to this. Um, and, you know, I think there's, I've seen other proposals for what a dream breaker would, would look like, or a tiebreaker would look like. Um, singles is still a very interesting element of, of pickleball. I think it actually translates better to television than doubles does. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, I like it. I mean, I it cr obviously created some awesome moments. How does singles in a dream breaker differ from singles in just regular tournament play? It's, it is, it's way different. Yeah. yeah. Like, so different. yeah. Rachel, you, go ahead. I, I prefer it because, I mean, you just got to be out there for four points. And honestly, anything can happen. It is just about, I mean, it's not as much strategy. Like, it's just like, you got to make the ball, the foundations and like, I try to get to the net. Like I want to get up there and put high pressure on someone to pass me because I mean, it's already a high pressure situation and you want to, and you want to make them like have to hit the perfect shot. Um, but it's so different because in, in singles, I mean, you can kind of get away with being lackadaisical in the head and I don't know, you can't do that in four points. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the big difference is obviously Fitness shouldn't come into into play whatsoever. Uh, you're playing probably a maximum of 12 points, 12, possibly 16 if it's a super, super long. I don't, I don't think there's a way that there's 16 points. but um, And over the course of a long singles match, players adapt. There's, there's an ebb and flow to a match, and there's no such thing in a, in a dream breaker. Right. So in a dream breaker, there's no easing into a mat or into a, into right. a point. It's like, you gotta get out there. You gotta get, you better be ready. And there's no, in a dream breaker, there's no, I'm going to hit this shot early in the match to set up this shot later in the match. It is go for your shots, go for your best shots all the time right. in a dream breaker rather than, you know, in a singles, in a full singles match, it's like, okay, you know, passing cross court has worked three times, but I'm going to show them the down the line shot. So they have to guard it for whatever. There's just a, uh, it's, it's go from start to finish. Yeah. Right. All right. So you guys win both in, uh, in a dream breaker. What was that? What was that final point? Like, um, how, how the Rachel, how did that feel? to have everything on your shoulders and, and pull it off. And, uh, yeah. What was that like? And was your, was your like family at home watching or is your phone blowing up? Like, what is that like? My family? parents actually came to watch, which was really, it meant a lot to me. Um, but yeah, after like my phone had like hundred text messages and my Instagram, I was forced, I, I was actually on private before. Um, cause I don't really do my social media that much. Like right. my Instagram's just been popping off and I, I mean, thank you, but it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. She she clinched both Dream Breakers for us. She won three points in a row in both of the final, in both Dream Breakers to, to win it. I think we were up 18-10 both times she got the uh, the ball. Yeah. But it also helps to have such like an amazing buffer. Like I can just go out there and I just swung out and was like, oh, I, I get to be the person to finish it. But like I had an eight-point buffer from my teammates who killed it. Right. So you could just really go for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. All right. Now that you, now that you've had to come off private on Instagram, are you going to, um, follow suit and go like create like a Rachel, uh, underscore PB, like the rest of the pickleball players? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Do I will. By the way, Zane, maybe you know this. Do a bunch of players have like their own personal accounts and then the pickleball accounts, like the underscore PV? I, I don't know. I uh... why is that a thing in pickleball? Uh, that's what I was gonna say. It's not a thing in tennis, so I don't think right. I'm gonna. I think it was because like early on, you you people thought that like it would be somebody searching for pickleball, you might come up. Yeah. I don't know. Mine's like a brand account, right? It's the Zane right. Evertill. It's Zane Evertill pickleball. Is the I don't know the the thing. Do you have a personal account? Kind of. I haven't used it since high school. It's Gucci Zane. <laughs> That's it. where the nickname came from. I gotta get on that because when you guys oh, it's very private. When you guys started it's, winning, it's an exclusive. I was like immediately going way back in your feed just to find like goofy like high school pictures of you. 
so I could just post those and be like, yeah, you guys just lost to this. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a plethora of those. Yeah. Uh, okay, Zane, for you personally, obviously not uh, the best track record of late up until this one in Major League Pickleball. Does feel a little vindicating for you? I mean, no, but MLP is boomer or bust. Like I, I, it, in as much as you might find this hard to believe, I enjoyed MLP last year on the pandas while we were getting our shit kicked in. <laughs> like, like it wasn't, I like it. You know, we, we made risky picks. Um, clearly did not work, but it is what it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously great to be, to be back on, on top with it. Um, but uh yeah i mean i just i just have so much more fun playing the team stuff yeah and obviously winning winning helps but it doesn't change the fact that it's the mlp is 10 times more fun to play than anything else right right outside of rachel being the clear x factor if you could boil it down to any other like one thing that made your team different what what would you say anything come to mind i made it different from other people's yeah, just kind of being like the differentiator for you guys. Yeah, honestly, in my opinion, I mean, this sounds like such a college tennis player response, but the team aspect, like we were all teammates to each other. Like you, we were like when I, when Zane and I were playing, Anna was like on the ground cheering for us. Like she was basically on the court with us. And I just think like I looked over and watched the matches and it just didn't look like that, in my opinion, for anyone else. And I just think like our heart, like we, truly we trust each other respect each other and really wanted each other to win and it showed yeah i think having four people who all played college tennis is pretty big right because we all know how to be good teammates to one another yeah. um i mean and that's not to say like i'm sure you had some teammates that weren't great teammates i had teammates that weren't great dream teammates but like the four of us were all phenomenal teammates and I think that, you know, my time at at the Harvard of Southeast Wisconsin, if you exclude Madison right, of yeah. UW Whitewater, right. um, we had a great, great team chemistry. I learned how to be a very good team player there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's the same for Andre, Anna and and Rachel for sure. Right. So and also we had we had experienced people, people who were experienced in running and managing a team. Right. The DeVos family owns the Orlando Magic. We had a great supporting we had great team owners. We had we had Jeff there. We had Olivia there, who was awesome. Michelle was there for a little bit. Ryan, um, Amin, still have no idea what Amin does, but he was there. <laughs> he was playing. He, he won he takes titles. Yeah, he's he's got a he's got a bunch of titles. Don't know what Amin does, but he's great. Um, and he actually won another championship with the Orange Orlando Squeeze paddle. He won the uh, the pickle bowl for for his uh for his squad so i mean he's like he you know what i figured out what i mean is okay. he is like you know how those law firms and and cpa firms they have like their basketball teams that they play against yeah, each other yeah, with right, right. or softball teams mm -hmm. and they like bring in some person who's clearly not qualified to be an accountant just to be on their yeah, their yeah, softball right. team yeah. that's a mean <laughs> That's a mean. <laughs> okay. I like couldn't be Jeff, but that's a mean. I like a mean. What why is Jeff grumpy? Honestly, no, go ahead, Rachel. He's not really too like he's just blunt. Like he I don't know. He's just great. Like I love him. He is he's just so to the point. Like it pisses it might piss some people off, but he's like he was he was great. I don't he doesn't know a tremendous amount about like the strategy and all that stuff. Yeah. But he would come up to us in matches and we'd be like, all right, now step on their effing throat. Yeah, like right. stuff like that. And he's a he's a badass. Like he was a photographer. He was one of the best photographers for the Orlando Magic. Um, best photographers in the NBA at, when he worked for the Orlando Magic. Got us some unbelievably cool shots. He told me that like he would chirp the other team's players while he's taking pictures of them <laughs> right. um, in the NBA. Uh, okay, yeah. And so, like, he was on the court taking pictures of us and also chirping <laughs> um, Julian Arnold. <laughs> There's a, there was a point in our match on Sunday where Julian's hitting a return. Jeff is talking to him, and Julian's going, shut the hell up, while he's hitting the return. Right. <laughs> 
it was it was something uh, that, that can backfire with julian sometimes you know, oh yeah fire yeah we also told uh jeff to shut up after that <laughs> like we yeah. don't want to get julian too fired up right 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 so yeah there's just the the ownership group and the whole like supporting cast that they've created it just it just meshed super super well well what about playing with andre did you guys enjoy playing with andre did you guys get any of his uh you know philosophical quotes while you're while you're in the huddle rachel's laughing <laughs> stay hot <laughs> uh we read them as a team every morning okay together we would read all yeah we would we would read uh we would all get together read all 15 of his tweets from the previous day and we would wake up inspired every single day that's really um that's really touching yeah, yeah i felt touched <laughs> <laughs> so that was the difference <laughs> that that might be it yeah yeah what do you think do, uh, do they inspire you for any anything or another yeah man um anytime i'm not feeling it i'm tired i don't want to work uh my knees hurt i just go to andre's twitter and just scroll through um which i imagine many people do mm -hmm. yeah i've got notifications on for andre what about his celebrations? I don't need him because he tags me and everything, but I yeah, still have notifications. Yeah, right. on. <laughs> what about his celebrations, like when he's jumping up and down and stuff like that? You know what? I thought somebody was humping my leg, and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> there are some pretty funny. There's some pretty funny pictures of you guys. You're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> pretty close. So <laughs> that meme, that little meme, was so funny. I hate it, but it's really funny. <laughs> See, the thing is, the other three of us, me. Rachel and Anna, we were just jumping. Andre, there was something else going on there. Andre was like jumping. He's so tall. He was just like, like scrunched up. Like he was, he was like a little too far away, but he was trying to hug us. And then he had to like kind of get the hips going in order to get into the circle because he's like way taller than us. And it, it just felt like a dog humping my leg. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, if you don't know what we're talking about, listeners, you're going to have to go to memes of pickleball. And you're just going to have to go to memes of pickleball. I'm still a firm believer that energy and team chemistry can be like the, the true X factor. Uh, if, if all else fails, I feel like you guys had that to a T like you guys worked very well together. You hyped each other up, you brought the energy and you seem to all get along a lot. Yeah, I agree with that um all right where do we want to take this do we want to go now to uh to the questions that we have for rachel uh yeah do you want to do them like rapid fire let's do them rapid fire all right rip them all right how long have you been playing pickleball at a serious level uh maybe like a year okay why did you play the right side when you were clearly the alpha on the mixed court i love you zane <laughs> Zane said, wait, what did you say when I said you said that you would never play pickleball again if you played the right side and mixed? I didn't quite say that. I said, I think that things are going very wrong if if you and I have that's switched. Right. That's what Zane said. So that's why I didn't play the left. With Zane. Also, you were playing like a badass on the right. So I didn't think we needed to, to change anything. Oh, this is a good one. Do you wish that you had a better looking mixed partner? At times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Zanver924 wants to know, are you single and available? I'm not. Thank you, though. Yeah, I put the handle there just in case you want to shoot a DM. Maybe, you know, be the matchmaker, not just the agency change. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Zanver. What's it like being Rafa's daddy? How was it raising Rafa? Was he a good sleeper? No, when he was when he was uh, just seven years old, he would be running around the house, round him up. <laughs> <laughs> um, how impactful was Anna's determination and leadership in the win? I think she played a huge part um, in. I mean, every match she she was a great leader. She was a great captain, and I mean, she really helped me on the court, and she made me feel so comfortable to do what I do best and play my game. And um, she was very empowering for all of us. So she's she's the GOAT. All right. Vivian Glosman says, this isn't a question, just a thank you for my only mixed win. 
<laughs> you can thank Zane. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm getting thrown under the bus here. We, Vivian Glosman can thank... She can thank her own shank drop shot volleys off of my insane drives that she had like. Those are really good drives. Those are. Those are. That was an unfortunate. I mean, yeah, that was just unfortunate. Yeah, she played very well in that one. Um, What's it like to play with Zane? No pressure on this one. Just curious. I like playing with Zane. I mean, you're. I love your like how you call me partner. You're like sorry partner. Or here we go, partner. Like you guys call me partner, and that keeps it light. I never feel like you're mad or upset with any of my misses. Like you make you're like that's great. Like you make me feel like I don't have to be careful. Um, I like you as a partner, and you get hype. I love that. I don't feel like I annoy you if I say "come on" and I'm jumping up and down. So I had a good time. Love it. I'll ask this you're next. Really one. good comms too. How yeah. does it How does it feel to be better than Zane? I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, listen, it was it was a question you're gonna have to answer. Um, it feels good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can push me out of the way. You can do whatever. What do you think your strongest pickleball stat is? Maybe uh, you can change that to strength. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Yeah, Who, I don't yeah, know. I don't know what that means. Um, so if you asked me. Before this tournament, I'd see my backhand roll on the backhand side. Um, but I had I've that last backhand that I hit in singles was the first and only backhand roll I hit that whole tournament. I was like deprived. Um, but <laughs> other than that, I think my power. Oh yeah. How much does Riley Newman fear you in front of him after Sunday? <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Do you think Riley Newman is going to change his grip because of you? Um, I think if anyone can make him change his grip, it was that bad. <laughs> um, Would you have risked a pick on your own upside if you were in Anna's position or in the squeeze's position? Well, because I knew me, yes. But if I didn't... um. I'm not sure. I think I also think I got this wasn't mentioned before. I got a little fortunate. I had beaten Susanna Barr in the Newport tournament the week before the draft. So I think that was a little helpful maybe to Anna or someone else to kind of see that because I think it was between me, her and so a couple other people. But like so I did get a little fortunate that I get got some matchups of the people they were thinking about. Um, so maybe if I didn't know me. We already did this one a little bit, but describe the feeling of winning uh, the Dream Breaker point um, before you won it and then after. Before I won it, I was I was like, I want to be the one to <laughs> yeah. do this. Yeah. yeah, I was like, I don't, I'm going to be the one to do, do this. And then when I was running for that backhand, I was like... I knew I was going to do as I was running for it. So I was really excited to hit the roll. And then as I saw it, Jay didn't even take a step. I was like, thank God. And then I just start look, I immediately, as I see her not taking a step, I like turn to my team and it was just like the instant, like just, it was a great feeling. You can't explain it. It's just elated. All right. I think this is the last, the last question that we have here. And Anna Bright wants to know where you are on the hot, crazy matrix. Oh God! So you you rate your hotness and your your craziness on a scale of one to ten. Wait, what did you say? <laughs> what you, on one to watched, ten? You've never watched the YouTube video about the hot crazy matrix? No. All right, you, you have, have you have homework. You, yeah, you have some YouTubing to do. Hot crazy matrix. You have some uh, you have some some work to do. Yeah, I'll have I'll do some homework and then I'll get back to you. Yeah, we'll, like need a tweet. Crazy post, we'll need a tweet or a formal response from your Instagram, which is still private. Maybe, maybe not. not. Okay, it's not private anymore. So in order to, to see Rachel's response to the question about the hot crazy matrix, you'll have to follow her on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she's going to give a thoughtful <laughs> analysis later. For sure. Yeah. She's uh, going to pull up the whiteboard. I'll, give, board a, I'll give a 500 word essay. Yeah, I like it. All right, let's do uh, let's do a topic not related to Major League Pickleball. Something that broke this morning. 
Um, first of all, Rachel, were you like, a, did you watch a lot of tennis growing up? Were you a big tennis fan? Yeah, growing up, I did. I don't really watch it that much anymore. Um, all right. So sounds like the Bryan brothers are in pretty serious talks to make a run at pro pickleball. How do you, I mean, they're, they're 45 years old, right? They've haven't played tennis. They, they retired in, in 2020. Um, but they're double specialists, something we haven't seen, uh, transfer over before. Uh, how do you, how do you think they'll, they'll fare? Do you think they they have some, some potential if they make a run at pro pickleball? I think so. Um, I, I mean, they were amazing in doubles and they had amazing hands. I mean, I don't remember exactly how they played tennis, but I mean, I think if they commit to it, I think they'd be pretty darn good. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? Like can tennis players come over and transition easily? Typically it comes down to hands. Like if you have touch at the net and if you're able to really like think uh, strategically about the game and obviously you have to put in the reps. So, um, I mean, they, clearly want to be number one they want to be the best but it's not going to be an easy path for them they're going to have to put in some serious some serious time what about you zane what do you what do you think about that i would just have to think they've got to be so sick of grinding they've grinded <laughs> for like 40 years at this point yeah. like why do they want to grind to become the the best at this like they don't have anything else left to to prove but so if they take it seriously, absolutely. Like if they're really going to go out and play three hours a day and go drive to, go drive an hour to go play with the best players in the area. Like if they're going to do all those little things, absolutely they can they can be there. Uh, you know I don't know if they're going to go drive an hour each way to go find good competition. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. All right, back to Major League Pickleball. Julian Lauren ended up playing. I think we called it here on the pod. Did you see it coming? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, right? So I have a hot take on that. Okay. I don't think that they had a lawyer write that for them. Interesting. I think that they wrote that themselves. You think they were playing some poker? It, it was an interesting statement. And the, the thing that I thought was strange about it was the wording that they said they were under no obligation to play. Like, that's, that might be accurate. But I don't know if that's a good enough reason to go away from your team. Yeah, no right? legal obligation, but you debatably have an obligation to your teammates. Right. And that's the part of that that statement that I felt like a a lawyer or an agent would have hopefully told them, like, that's not a great thing to include on that. Well, it's a, an attorney, not a PR person. Fair. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, sure. Right. But like, I mean, there there should be other considerations. So I didn't think that 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 was uh, that that looked great. Yeah, um, Rachel. All right, what is uh, what does the next few months look like for you in uh, in pro pickleball? Um, playing a couple more PPAs. I have Vegas PPI, and then um, a little exhibition thing um, down in Florida. Then um, MLP. That's before Dallas Nationals, right? Yep. Yeah, so then, then I got the next MLP, and then I think I only have after that two more PPA tournaments before the last one, and then done for the year, I think. Who are your partners? Who do you have lined up? Um, so for Vegas, I have Jackie Kalmoto and Rafa Hewitt, um, and then I am I think I'm with Callan Dawson the rest of the year in mixed. And um, women's, I have one more with Rihanna Valdez, and then unknown for Daytona the Pictona Holly Hill one. So I need a partner for that. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Zane, what else you got? Anything? I got nothing. Um, Rachel, thanks for coming on and, and putting up with the, uh, first off, putting up with us. And then second <laughs> off, putting up with, um, with the technical difficulties that we've had, but yeah, great to, uh, great to chat and let, uh, let the pickleball world get to know you. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Rachel Aurora on uh, on Instagram. You can follow her now. Tell them what pod it is. Tell tell the viewers what pod this is. The pickle pod. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Uh, all right, that's it. All right. If you're in pickleball, you know Takea. They're everywhere. It's no secret that staying hydrated is key to playing your best. Just ask Riley Newman, who is always sporting his Takea water bottle. 
guy literally brings it everywhere. Uh, from regulating your body temperature to keeping your cognitive function sharp on the court, hydration is your best teammate. And what better way to keep the precious H2O by your side than the Takea's innovative bottles, known for their best lid ever, which can keep water cold for over 26 hours. Perfect for the heat. Don't just take our word for it. Experience the Takea difference today. Visit TakeaUSA.com to find the perfect water bottle for you. That's T-A-K-E-Y-A-U-S-A.com. All right, we're excited to introduce you to Holbrook Pickleball, the go-to brand for players of all skill levels. Founded by Bragan and Kaysen Holbrook, alongside their father, Brody, Holbrook Pickleball is revolutionizing the game. What sets Holbrook Pickleball apart is their commitment to innovation and style. They've created three exceptional paddle series tailored to amplify the game of every player. They just launched a new paddle as part of their Pro Series line called the Power Pro. The Power Pro is engineered with groundbreaking technology to amplify the power, durability, and touch of your shots for next level performance. Next level performance. But Holbrook Pickleball doesn't stop at functionality. Their paddles and gear are the perfect fusion of cutting edge tech and eye-catching design. They're actually sick. Um, Go, just go check out the website. You'll see the designs are awesome. Uh, countless hours of development have gone into creating gear engineered to help you play better and look good doing it. So whether you're an intermediate, advanced, or pro player, Holbrook Pickleball has the paddle that's right for you. This would be like the perfect paddle to go buy somebody who's like super into style and looking cool on the court. Uh, super catchy uh, look to them. And uh, yeah, so you can experience the innovation style and performance that sets Holbrook Pickleball apart. Visit HolbrookPickleball.com today and elevate your pickleball game to new heights. So that's H-O-L-B-R-O-O-K, Pickleball.com. And we're just going to sling it. All right. We've got Bonham here from Swimply. He goes, how do you typically do these things? And the answer is we absolutely sling it with zero prep. Sometimes we do prep, uh, but for the most part, we just like to complete. swing it or sling it. So the two sling, things. Sling. Sling it. We shoot okay. the hit, baby. Go. All right, so a little intro on you. I mean, you're you're the founder of Swimply, which we've mentioned on the pod before. I like to describe it as the Airbnb of pickleball, right? You started with pools, and now you've recently transitioned and gone pretty hard into the, the pickleball space, clearly saw an opportunity there. But maybe we can hear it from the horse's mouth. Is that the right idiom? Yeah, we'll go with it. Yeah. Can't Tell me a little bit stuff. about the, the business. What's Swimply about? What are you guys trying to do? And how's everything going in the pickleball world so far? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're kind of noobs to the pickleball world. Yeah. But like you said, we're going we're going deep. I mean, definitely yeah. wide as well. Yeah. Um, we started with pools in 2019. I'm the oldest of 12. Okay. Um, Why that it? We were a 12th kid in uh, 2019 and 2018. And uh, we never really had the means to travel or send anyone to camp or anything like that. And our neighbor built a pool right next to us. And she figured if she let us use it once, we would like live in her backyard which is like a fair forecast. Okay. <laughs> and so she arms up, but then um, eventually it just, uh, when the summer came around, it was just non-negotiable. Um, no one's even in school, so we're pretty much at home all day. Um, I heard her kind of complaining about how much it was costing her, and I was like, hey, what if we like helped you out and exchange, you know, you let us use it once or twice. How old are you at this point? Um, 20... What? Okay. 21. And um, she said, sure. And so we agreed to pay 25% of our expenses in exchange. Um, we got to use it whenever our grandkids weren't around. And yeah. They were never around, thank God. So it really worked out well. But within two weeks, people caught on. And she had five other families mm -hmm. paying her the same 25%. <laughs> and this is around July of 2018. And I realized, hey, this woman's making money from something she was complaining about. Single. And it was kind of just extremely underutilized. And so I decided... Um, to maybe make like a small micro business out of this. I went to Google Earth, found a bunch of other pools, knocked on a bunch of doors, got um, people to agree to go out when they weren't, put my phone number around town, he'd call me, he'd call the owner, called them back. Right. And then it kind of just took off from there. Uh, Wait, where did this Where did this start? This was in Lakewood, New Jersey. Okay. So and this was only pools at the time. And so um, it was really exciting. I really loved like giving people access to these kind of things. And the fact that my family was every once in a while calling me for a pool whenever yeah, the pool right. next door was being used by a neighbor. Um, yeah, it was kind of hilarious. Broker. Yeah, pretty much. I was a pool pimp. <laughs> yeah, I like um, that. And so, uh, yeah, I decided to just pursue this and be like, hey, we can 
bring this everywhere. And we said for Lake New Jersey, and we can potentially do this with everything. Like why specifically pools? Right. So I drop out. I learned what it takes about like tech and whatnot. I do absolutely nothing. I was studying in Talmudic University. I pretty much just biblical text all day. Okay. So okay. what an LLC was. So does that mean you would have gone into like I would have been like double door looking or... rabbi, but okay. not for this. Got it, Ken. Probably, yeah. Um, if you're gonna go to the extreme end, I, mean, I definitely <laughs> yeah, right. I generally tend to take the extreme from rabbi to like yeah. capitalism. So cool. yeah, but what is stopping you from still just doing the Dumbledore look? I mean, I'm still young, still got time. I don't okay. think still me. Yeah, I have a promising Dumbledore future out of me. I did have a really nice beard until recently. Uh-huh. And then I was um, experimenting with it and screwed up. And so I'm generally, I have more potential than I look. Got it. Than it looks. Yeah, I'm right. But I drop out, raise a million bucks, launch Swimply with the idea that every passion needs a space. Um, and we stuck really close to pools because it's what we right. knew worked and we can find them on Google Earth. Um, over the next three years, uh, we raised another um, two rounds of capital, raised $41 million. To date, we launched in 125 markets. Uh, we have an office in Los Angeles um, and in Sydney. Okay. Um, around half the company is remote. And uh, this past summer, um, we began to capitalize on our true vision of like, what we build really has nothing to do with pools. We democratize access for people that want access to something they'll potentially never own or w- not worth owning. Right. Um, and uh, you know they're sometimes not worth owning because on the supply side, people are maximizing its value mm-hmm. in quite um, incredible ways. And so with the rise of pickleball, it, I would say that two things make us, made us jump in the pickleball. One was how fast it was clearly growing. Yeah. But more importantly, um, there are a lot of things that were, I think, fit our criteria that already had like a larger sad, like a larger market for us to disrupt. But what we really loved about pickleball is it was like pools, senior citizens are using it and families are using it and kids are using it and it was fun for everybody. Right. Um, and it was more than just swimming. It was never about swimming. And most people don't build a pool so they can get wet. Ultimately, it is about the space and about cr- spending time together and having like these really cool call to action moments that create memories. Right. And so pickleball fit our whole criteria. Like mm-hmm. it was growing so virally because of how, how what open arms kind of had for anybody who wanted to try it. Right. And uh, people were like drinking while they were playing. And like, yeah. it was more about the memories and the moments you're creating sometimes. And for others, it was like professional. And that was exactly like it was with Swimply. We had professional athletes, like Sports Illustrated wrote a whole article about how people were using it during COVID mm-hmm. to maintain their training. But it was also about fun. And so pickleball just fit all of our values. And so we went head on, launched a pickleball division. Cool. Okay. Started in LA. Um, then we launched in Austin. And I think now we're like in eight markets. Got it. All around. Right. And we have around 500 locations. Yep to start and this is only as of uh three months ago so okay much faster growth than we even had yeah right okay and how old are you i'm right now 26 okay, you're 26 you've raised 41 million dollars you've got offices in la and in sydney uh that seems seems pretty cool pretty ambitious for a, a 26 year old yeah yeah, just local. <laughs> yeah uh so when you think about like how you're gonna build and, and grow the business what is like the percentage of focus on pickleball versus pools. And now I hear you're also kind of going into kitchens and I imagine you're looking at other categories as well. Yeah, I would say the way to look at it for us, especially in this like startup environment, they're really, they grow at all costs and kind of be crazy and break things. Um, for good or for worse, is kind of falling out of style. Yeah. Um, and so I would say with the pool category, um, at this point, it's, it's you. One would define it as being at escape velocity. It's doing tens of millions a year, and tens of millions a year. And like the big focus on the pool category um, is really to like create efficiency and make it profitable in like mm-hmm. record time. Most marketplaces, you know, a lot of them are public and have recently become profitable. Maybe because so we're with the pool category, it's really one hundred percent focus on just making it efficient, streamlining it, making it the perfect experience. Right. Where the innovation and the aggression and the, I'd say the startup mind, I'd say 100% of it right now is probably going um, into new verticals with around now to 80% of it being on pickleball. It's working, it's going fast, it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. People are using the pickleball category on average two or three times more often than the pool category, you can imagine. Um, And that's only with like 90 days of data. So we saw Steve's courts on there last time. We looked it up. I looked it up on uh, on the pod last time. We got Steve. Yeah, Steve's too. yeah, he's got his his uh his courts on there. Yeah, we actually had, um I think we had a Barbie pickleball event at Steve's Coon. Yeah, watching Steve I, at Pink I, I, in the 
Simply Doc, I think, was worth starting the company just for that. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, can we go back to you've raised forty one million? How'd you get? To, how'd you? How did you raise your first million? Like, is that first with like friends, family, or did you come out with the full like business plan? Take it to bank? Like, yeah, not even close. I would say so. In the so I'm an Orthodox Jew, and we have these really every Friday night. There's like a Shabbat meal, and uh, a lot of juice that pretty much just gather and drink and eat. No phones, nothing. And uh, generally speaking, you're not allowed to talk about business. And I kind of just like broke that rule. And every Shabbat meal I went to, I started talking <laughs> who the richest guy in the room was. And often it would be nobody worth talking to, but pretty much just like raised off Shabbat meals. <laughs> um, Did that work for the next, you know, 30? No, no. It turns out uh, you know, that, that, that method does cap out. But I did pitch. Like most people, I would just get them to agree to meet with me. Yeah. Because getting intros, these people were not really too easy. Mm-hmm. As a 21 year old is trying to put strangers in people's backyards, but yeah. Shabbat meals is when I would talk them into it, kind of like meet with me, and then meet me. I did pitch around like 80 people until I got the first person to write the first a quarter million dollar check, and once he did it, I went back to the first 80, and like got like three of them. To write right, the create them. create a little FOMO. Yeah. But the next round was it doesn't get easier. We launched we launched something in 2019. We grew and it was great. I think we did like 200 grand in revenue the first summer. Um, in 2019, um, but, and then I ambitiously tried to raise a seed round, like a two and a half million dollar seed round, learned about SF, Silicon Valley, the whole shebang, decided it was for me, flew to SF, crashed on couches, did the whole shebang. Uh, it was really romantic. The whole time I'm there, I'm like, this would be good for the movie. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Hey. And then, uh, yeah, we just didn't raise, I pitched like 50 VCs, it wouldn't kind of fit me out of there. Um, yeah. Too much liability, mm-hmm. um, too much concerns. If you have a pool, you're too rich to do this. Right. Kind of thing. A lot of yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. So let's 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 talk about that because that's one of the questions, right? And you even mentioned my business is putting strain or strangers in, in people's backyards, right? Mm-hmm. How do you convince somebody? When I think of somebody who has a pool or, you know, like a great backyard, I think of somebody who probably has a decent amount of money and doesn't really give a shit about, you know, making a, a little side hustle income. So like how do you convince people to open up their backyards to strangers as as you put it? So there are two people that need to be convinced. One's the homeowners and yeah. the second being the the investors. So now the investors, I was never able to pitch, convince. Yeah. I um, pretty much didn't believe it. Um, but then it just happened. Mm-hmm. And then numbers don't lie. You were like, here's the proof. Yeah. yeah. And then it came down to, okay, so why is it happening? Why are they so attracted to this? Because we didn't really have money for marketing. Like word of mouth is really mostly how we grew. Um, we also had an episode that aired on Shark Tank that helped us really oh, go okay. file. Sure. And whatnot. And ultimately, just like talking at this point to hundreds of hosts and users, um, A, start with the concept that this is not for people that hate people. And that's what. These people are hospitable people by nature. They love people. Right. Um, they have a backyard that is kind of just sitting there and sometimes it presents something really depressing. That mm-hmm. like their kids have moved out or that aren't not as many people moved in there. Right. Right. right? And they, again, they didn't build that pool to get wet. They build that pool to create memories and to have space. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, and now it's just sitting there. And so ultimately putting it to work and giving back is a big ambition for why people start. And then ultimately people just make 10 grand a month sometimes and it just makes it just addicting. And what we've seen owners do to turn it into a real business was beyond our wildest imagination. We have owners that offer masseuses and birthday party setups and just gone on and all these additional yeah. add-ons and like the butler service. And this one owner in New York that I booked cooked me a whole poolside dinner like pizza and poured champagne and then it rained on us so he like decided to like make up for it make it up to us with like another course right and just kept on coming out with more things while we're in the pool it was like a lot of these owners just make it a real passion for them Mm -hmm. um and the second piece is you realize that we're not really strangers that much like at the end of the day like our biggest host the most popular demographic for a host is like a mom in her 30s Mm -hmm. and our biggest person who's renting the pools is a mom in her 30s with their kids. Right. And they both obviously love pools enough from spending time with their kids and sure. they both come from the same city. So on like a similar platform, let's say like Airbnb, you're hosting Queens and you're hosting someone from Panama, there may be a massive disconnect there. Mm-hmm. And this is like purely transactional. But these people went to the same high schools. You know, they had the same history often. And with Pickleball, we're finding that is on steroids. Because in Pickleball, okay, yeah, the passion is even more niche and more specific. And so now these are people who are passionate enough about pickleball, they're building their own court, 
renting out the people that are passionate about, enough about pickleball that they'll rent their own court mm -hmm. and spend obviously like more than what it'll cost. It yeah, might be like a way to just get a game. <laughs> a lot of these yeah. owners, like I've seen in descriptions, must be invited. Like I must be allowed to like play their remote. Oh, game. right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know if they're joking or not. But yeah, like it's definitely I like they're able to rotate in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hundred percent. Just a, such a social sport, and so like especially with pickleball, and I think as we launch more categories and get more and more about people's more specific passions, mm -hmm. um, it really does demystify the stranger piece. Often, got it. Overlap can make us friends really right. quickly. Okay. So this is a pickleball podcast. So you have to say nice things about pickleball, obviously, but mm. do you view the category of pickleball as like a stepping stone or do you see it as being a huge portion of the business and a big revenue driver? So I said this when we just launched, we had, we had an interview with like CNBC, like they like announced it. Yeah. Kind of thing for us. And I did say that I think it's going to be bigger than the pool category mm -hmm. for us, which is the yeah. launch category and mainly just because of how often people are using it like they're addicted right right and i started playing and i got to i'm gonna have a pool pimp to the prince pickleball <laughs> yeah. i currently have the pickleball pimp wherever i'm at yeah I start to i like the pickleball pimp See, there is a there is a prince of pickleball already all right i don't want to step in on toes yeah I step in yeah. yeah so yeah. but i to my knowledge there's not a pickleball pimp that, you, okay. that could be you no. yeah it is appropriate it just fits with the history yeah, yeah yeah there you go uh, no. so yeah so um i do think the repeat rate and how fast it's growing and how the, much how much more accessible it is to build a pickleball court. You don't need the same amount of real estate. You right. don't need nearly the amount of capital, mm -hmm. right? And cool. so the, for the owner side, it's super accessible. Mm. Um, and even more importantly, I think we have with the pool category, a lot of people reaching out to us saying, hey, we're thinking of building a pool. How much can, can we rent it out on? Simply for to help us pay back. Right. That's They're thinking about subsidizing an investment Correct. in something they can build for themselves, but Correct. Awesome. So it, just make, it makes it a lot more. If you're just going to, so when you build a pool, it tends to be one, a really bad financial investment. It's kind of like a boat, it constantly costs mm -hmm. you money. And so people right. with simply building building a pool and then with the idea that they actually will have it cover itself and probably make you a profit at some point um, is an ambition that a lot of people are doing. And look, we're giving people little coordinates. Hey, if you live in the city, like you'll have your pool way back in like mm -hmm. three years. Uh, and then from that point on, it'll be a profit. Um, with pickleball, it's profoundly more, profoundly faster, a lot more realistic. And right. Also, like a lot less, um, I guess the worst case scenario with the pool category, with the pickleball court is quite tame compared to like the pool alternative. Um, with the pool Fair. category, you can have 60 people, five people. You can set your own rules and you're totally in charge, but people's imagination can go wild even with all the rules and stuff. And thank God we've put over a million people in these backyards and 99.99% right. of the time, it's a totally seamless experience for a reason. Um, but with pickleball, yeah, you're sharing it with other pickleball players, and now you have a court in your backyard. You're making money from it too, which is nice. right? So. Well, there's a big time. Just the the supply and demand of courts are not equal currently, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if just knowing in Austin, right, we we've discussed this. Like, if I want to go play, I'm either waiting in line at a public place, or I'm going to my buddy who has a private court. Who, like, honestly, this probably sounds perfect for um it's it's sean the stop alzheimer's now guy we should i'm gonna get him on on swimply that's the that court you always play at. that's the court that i play at we'll, right. i'll get him on there and i'll just see if he'll, he'll give that revenue to to the nonprofit. i bet he would mm. um so anyway well i'll pitch that idea okay. but um first off there's the big inefficiency between supply and and demand and other thing that i've noticed is I'm getting married in, in March of next year. I'm looking for some Airbnbs for like my family and whatnot on the West side. The amount of places that are like first thing in their listing is has pickleball court blew my mind, right? Like people are advertising this on, on Airbnb. They're, they're really pitching the fact that they've got a, a pickleball court in some Texas mansion. Like it's the hottest new, new thing. Like, mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's clearly here to stay, but at some point, I think there will be more public facilities, but you still might want to get away from the, the crowd and open play and arrange your own sort of games and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's kind of identical. Like the city with the most amount of public pools per person is Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, the city with the most amount of private pools is also Scottsdale, Arizona. There is a lot, a lot of the investment into like privacy and you having your own court or renting your own court has little to do with like, it definitely has to do with like the access. So I would say it wouldn't obviously be needed without it, but the privacy and being able to like be with the people that you want to play with and with no rush, no urgency. 
on your own terms is, I think, a big compelling reason. Um, I think no matter how many public courts you'll build, there'll always be like a need for privacy and, and whatnot. No matter how many public pools you'll build, people will still be building pools right. in their backyard. So are you leaning to that as a like a partial growth strategy? The the people that want to like potentially figure out a way to subsidize a court just because they want to build their own pickleball court? Because if you can help them do that, then they're building more infrastructure for you guys to exist. Yeah, I think we're we're definitely betting on us being a real enabler. Yeah, um, in that space, right? Uh, in order for it to get to the size we need it to be at, mm-hmm. for it to like be where we want it to be. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, all right. Um, well, we've got, uh, Rachel Rohrbacher coming on here in, uh, in a moment. So thanks for, for jumping on. It was a quick one, but figured it'd be cool for everybody to hear about what you're building. Um, thanks for having me. It's just fun slinging. Slinging it? Yeah. It's a fun thing. Yeah. The sling sesh? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. All right. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, darling, had fun on Yagi.